from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, and welcome to the most beautiful building in Washington, D.C. I want to thank you for choosing to be here today to learn about some incredible organizations that are supporting veterans as they transition from military service. I'm Karen Lloyd, a retired Army Aviation Colonel and Director of the Veterans History Project. It is an honor to be here today to moderate such an amazing panel. The Veterans History Project currently has over 108,000 collections that span from World War I through the current conflicts. We are proud that the majority of our collections span from private to captain, where I would suggest the real stories exist. We need all the stories so others will understand the sacrifice our veterans have made. Some of the veterans in the VHP collection served, but never were deployed overseas. Many went to war but never saw combat. Others saw combat from a variety of vantage points, at the tip of the spear, on a PT boat, in a cockpit or at a headquarters, and others paid the ultimate sacrifice. But the veterans we want to focus on today are those who return from service with a lasting reminder of their sacrifice. These brave men and women gave their sight, their hearing, their mobility, and many other aspects of their lives that we take for granted and return to a society that was not designed for their new normal. The VA and other government services are unable to provide everything they require, so out of necessity, nonprofit organizations have emerged to make sure these heroes have the support they need to move on with their lives. Our partner in this event, Homes for Our Troops, is one of those organizations. Homes for Our Troops builds and donates specially modified houses for severely injured veterans so that they can live the lives they did before they were injured, taking care of their family and their home with undue hardship. Our expert panelists represent not only Homes for Our Troops, but several other organizations dedicated to helping injured vets adjust to a world where accessibility and accommodation are all too often an afterthought, if it exists at all. The Elizabeth Dole Foundation, Hiring Our Heroes, and the VA all work tirelessly to ensure our veterans have the tools and resources they need. Today we will speak about how injured veterans can identify and access these resources. Our veterans have sacrificed so much to keep our country safe. Helping them live a more normal life is the absolute least that we can do for them. My goal is that this event inspires everyone within earshot to start thinking about what they can do for the veterans in their community, and a call to action to get involved with efforts like the, one you'll hear, uh, the ones you'll hear about today. So let's take a minute to meet our panelists and hear a little bit about them. First, we have Eric Eversoll, President, Hiring Our Heroes, a program of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Eric. Thank you. Um, um, Eric Eversoll, President of Hiring Our Heroes. Um, I'm also a currently serving Navy Reserve Officer uh, in the JAG Corps. I have been doing that for 23 years. Um, Hiring Our Heroes was an organization that was created by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce back in 2011. We were seeing a, a nationwide crisis of veteran unemployment. We had uh, tens if not hundreds of thousands of service members coming back, post 9-11 service members coming back to a very, very tough employment situation. In fact, by 2011, uh, for that post 9-11 veteran population, unemployment was over 11%. And so the chamber, uh, utilizing all of its state and local uh, state and chamber, chambers of commerce, uh, started hosting hiring events uh, throughout the country. In the first three years, we did uh, nearly 800 hiring events. And since that time, we've done over 1,100. Um, as we've worked to really reduce veteran unemployment as a whole, um, we knew that, um, that there were still significant populations of service members and their family members that continued to struggle. So as the unemployment rate has dropped, we've started to look at those targeted populations, transitioning service members, military spouses, caregivers, 
uh, wounded, ill, and injured service members to make sure that we can continue to help them find the meaningful employment opportunities they so richly deserve. Thank you very much. Steve Schwab is the Executive Director of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Steve. Thank you, Karen. Uh, it's an honor to be here this afternoon. Um, the Elizabeth Dole Foundation uh, was established in 2010 out of a really profound personal experience uh, by my boss, Senator Elizabeth Dole, who, if you know anything about Elizabeth Dole, has had a, an unbelievable 40-plus year public service record. But something that a lot of people don't know is that she has um, tirelessly, lovingly um, acted as her husband Bob's veteran caregiver. Um, at 95, he's doing well today, better than he was at 94, actually. Um, but he's had his medical ups and downs. And in 2010, after serving nearly a year at Walter Reed at his side, she came to know the plight, uh, the stresses, the anxieties, um, and the burdens, frankly, that a lot of uh, caregivers, military spouses, mothers, fathers, siblings, and other loved ones were shouldering to care for their wounded warriors once they leave the hospital. And so we established the foundation in 2010. We started by doing evidence-based research with RAND, and that study told us that there's five and a half million military and veteran caregivers across America. And these folks are experiencing um, depression, immune deficiency issues, cardiac issues, all because of the hours that they're putting in, in addition to raising their families, trying to hold down a job while taking care of their loved one at home. Tomorrow is September 11th, um, and it's been 17 years since the longest period of war in US history started. And we as a nation are still learning uh, what it means, what it truly means to take care of those who have gone to war since that time. Um, and one of the biggest um, uh, phenomenons that we've uh, uh, realized as a country is how many of these veterans need to be cared for in their home and how it's transformed the needs of families and caregivers and the community, frankly, and certainly the VA, and how we need to treat, um, train, prepare, and care for veterans and their loved ones at home. And so that's what we focus on at the Dole Foundation. Wow, thanks, Steve. Uh, next, Brigadier General Tom Landemeyer, President and CEO of Homes for Our Troops. Tom. Thanks, Karen. So I had the uh, distinct honor and privilege to serve for 33 years in our nation's army and uh, served with uh, distinct pleasure with some of the folks inside this room. Um, and then for almost two years now, have been working with Homes for Our Troops. Um, our mission, as Karen actually said pretty well, so she could almost be one of our ambassadors. <laughs> but um, we build specially adapted custom homes uh, across the country, and then we donate them to the most severely injured post-9-11 veterans to enable them to rebuild their lives. So uh, our mission, even though we're a national 501c3, we really see our mission as the moral obligation of our country. Uh, to pay, pay back in, in very small part uh, a huge debt that can never be completely repaid to the troops and their families that uh, they raised their right hand, they volunteered, they served very selflessly, and they sacrificed tremendously uh, for the freedoms that uh, we're allowed to enjoy every single day. Um, we've built uh, 261 of these homes in 42 states so far. Uh, the homes themselves are, are about, they're on about an acre of ground, um, about 2,700 square feet. Um, four bedroom, two bath. They're really built with uh, 40 plus special adaptations inside. Uh, they're really built for a twofold reason. One, to allow that veteran to regain some of the freedom and independence that they lost when they were injured. And also, from the spouse and caregiver side to reduce the stress and the burden on our spouses and caregivers and let them get on with rebuilding their lives as well. There's a few things that are unique to our organization uh, when you start looking at others in our space. One, the veterans tell us where they'd like to live. We go out, find the land, bounce it off our veterans to make sure they're at, that's what they want. Then we uh, buy it and build them a home from the ground up. Um, Second is uh, three years of financial planning assistance that we provide all of our veterans and their families pro bono to ensure they're set up for success as a homeowner. Uh, and then third, a real 
extremely unique one is that we stay in touch with our veterans after we give them the keys. So we don't just put a number up on the chalkboard, we've got another home done, we stay in touch with them. One, we wanna make sure that the quality of the home is as we promised. If there's something wrong with it, we're gonna fix it. Uh, second, we need feedback on those special adaptations that we put into the home to make sure they're working for the veterans and the families. Back in Taunton, Massachusetts at our headquarters, we can't tell if they're the right adaptations, but the families living them day out and day out, day in, day out can. And then third, uh, we really, what's important to us is rebuilding lives aspect. We want to know how they're getting on with rebuilding their lives. So glad you're here today. Next, we have Sergeant Curry and his lovely wife, Sam, American heroes to the core. Uh, you take my breath away. I want to thank you for coming today to be a part. Thanks, Karen. So I'm Army Sergeant Stephen Curry. I served five years in the Army as an infantryman, uh, deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, my last deployment, I was injured by a roadside bomb, which uh, resulted in the amputation of my left leg below the knee. Um, the reason I'm here today is in 2016, I was provided a home by Homes for Our Troops. And um, it's really helped um, my well-being and my families over the past uh, almost two and a half years, um, just getting back into uh, a, a normal way of life and uh, rebuilding our lives and, and just help me out physically as well. Sam, few words. I'm Samantha. I am the caregiver spouse of uh, Stephen. I will definitely say that the last couple of years has been amazing um, because of the house that we were given. Definitely has opened up lots of doors for myself and our girls and even Stephen most recently. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. And last but not least, J Jason Beardsley, who's an advisor to the Veterans Affairs Secretary. Jason. Uh, thank you. So I'm Jason Beardsley. I spent um, about 22 years in the military, both in the Navy and the Army, and uh, had the pleasure to serve in our special operations community and uh, see a lot of uh, the work that gets done on the forward edge of the battlefield. Uh, I came over to the Department of Veterans Affairs this summer uh, to represent our veteran service organizations. And uh, in that role, uh, represent them on behalf of the Secretary of the VA. And part of that is uh, doing exactly what I think most of you have laid out here in the panel. And it's, it's humbling to be here, um, one with heroes, fellow service members, thank you, uh, all of you. But also to hear about the way you're each uh, really servicing the veterans past their experience. And it's one of the most important things, and of course that's what we do in the VA. We're tasked with taking that service member and closing the loop between their service and then the rest of their career, their, their life's career. And I think somebody said it best here, but uh, finding that next mission, and sometimes that's very, very difficult and very challenging because of what they've seen in the battlefield. So from hiring to building homes, uh, to being the veteran that actually uh, found that next mission and has turned around as a caregiver uh, to teach others and train others is exactly what the VA uh, supports. We can't do all the work ourselves, and so we rely on our community and caregivers to help us with that. Very honored to be here. Well, thank you, Jason, very much, and thank you all for being here. And so now that you've met the panelists, uh, let's start the discussion. So, Eric. Your organization focuses on veterans transitioning to the civilian workforce. What should veterans know about this transition, and what are the resources available to help equip veterans with transferable skills? Well, that's a great question, and I think it's a question that quite honestly has evolved um, since the time we started doing our work back in 2011. You know, as I mentioned earlier, in 2011, you know, veteran unemployment was such a national crisis, we were really doing triage at that time. I mean, we were just trying to find jobs for veterans, get them back into the workforce. In many instances, it wasn't necessarily the right job or the, the best job. It was simply a job so that they could start, you know, building that confidence and, and finding those opportunities. Uh, but as we've really started to shift our focus, we really started to think about, you know, who's that customer set? Who's that veteran and military spouse population that we serve? And, and quite honestly, why is this transition process so challenging? Uh, and, and what we found was that a lot of organizations, and I think for a while uh, we were in 
included in that. A lot of organizations took the field of dreams approach. You just build it and they would come and all the problems would be solved, right? And, and we would just find them jobs and we'd have somebody create these 80, 90, $120,000 jobs and people would just flock to them. And that didn't happen. It didn't happen because what we forgot is that a lot of our young men and women who serve and their family members are still coming from predominantly blue collar, low and middle income families. They're not the lowest 10%, so it's not that they're you know, you know, really destitute, but they're good, hardworking, middle class families, predominantly coming from the South and the Midwest, predominantly in the Southwest. Um, and the reality is, is that this population, uh, including their family members, don't know what they don't know about real economic opportunity in this country. What does a 21st century career look like? Uh, mm -hmm. And oftentimes, uh, um, it, you know, their perception on industry and opportunity was what they saw on TV. So if you ask them about transportation industry, it's like Smokey and the Bandit. That's their image is bar fights and, you know, outrunning the law with bootleg liquor. Uh, you know, manufacturing was like Laverne and Shirley. And, and these industries and these opportunities uh, don't look anything like what they did 30 or 40 years ago. Go visit a Toyota manufacturing facility that is so clean and so technologically advanced. You can eat off the floor. Uh, and you start to look at, you know, in transportation and, you know, um, what these opportunities look like. So what I, one thing I would say about what we've learned about, you know, um, from the outset is you really have to help these young men and women who have sacrificed so much understand what real economic opportunity, what the American dream looks like. And if they can start to figure that out, then they can start to figure out what are the skills and the certifications that they need so that they can really uh, uh, grasp a hold of those opportunities not a year after they leave military service because that's what we found a lot of them were doing. They would, you know, they, they I mean, we did a study on this. Nearly half of them would spend four more months after leaving the service unemployed. Okay. They'd take wow. the first job that they could find, and they would half of them would leave it within the first year. Okay. Uh, and 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 so we've really started to focus on you know understanding, creating partnerships with organizations. There's a lot of great companies doing some incredible work, uh, uh, providing service members with uh, credentials and certifications before they leave. Microsoft has this great software and services academy that are providing, I think 90% of their, their graduates are, are graduating um, and getting jobs, paying $90,000 a year within the first year. Nice. Uh, we have a corporate fellowship program where we take active duty service members right before they get out, pair them with the company. About 90% of our fellows are getting hired for about $90,000 a year. Um, and importantly, they're staying in that job for more than a okay. year. So I, I think overall, you know, you know, we can't just assume that if we just create jobs that they're gonna to flock to them. We have to take the time to understand how do we help train them and help lead them uh, so that they can continue to serve our country in a slightly different uniform. Yeah. What an amazing series of lessons learned. Thank you for sharing. Um, Steve, you mentioned the RAND, the 2014 RAND report, and what was significant from my perspective that it said that military caregivers are the best chance a wounded warrior has to thrive and recover. What makes caregivers so important and what is being done to include them in the entire treatment process? Thanks for that question, Karen. Um, you know, I'll step back a little bit um, and suggest uh, a big part of the work that we've undertaken as a foundation um, is to educate uh, okay. Americans educate clinicians and leaders at the VA, policymakers, um, and citizens across the country that this population exists, that Sam has brothers and sisters across America who are struggling to okay. care for their wounded warriors at home. And so the study that we did pointed out an alarming statistic that there's millions of these folks in every corner of the country, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we had to bridge a cultural competency divide, which we've been working on for the last number of years. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to bring leaders in the VA, all of our policymakers, and mayors across the country up to speed that there were another set of needs beyond the needs of the veteran proper, okay. right? And so the study said 
um, as well, the headline that you just um, uh, highlighted, which is that uh, statistically and scientifically, the, the most direct way to improve the health of the veteran is by strengthening training, educating, and fortifying that caregiver. So if Sam is strong in her beautiful home, outfitted for the kinds of needs that they have as a unique family, okay. they're going to be a stronger family, right? Okay. Um, so when we uh, finished analyzing the study, we learned that one of the big gaps that was happening um, inside of the system, the VA system, was that caregivers were not being integrated into the medical team. Oh. And it varied um, center by center how the caregivers um, were being um, integrated. So we started uh, a new program funded by USAA to train doctors, nurses, and social workers on how to integrate caregivers into the medical team. And so it's called the Campaign for Inclusive Care. We're working across the VA system right now to train um, clinicians and social workers primarily how for the first time really to bring those caregivers in from day one okay. and how we make caregivers an active part of the care process. Wow. I mentioned earlier that um, services and support for veterans are largely moving toward the home. The VA is moving really, really quickly through an initiative called Choose Home to really shift the paradigm for care from those institutions that are based in every region across the country to <coughs> remote care in the home. And so we're working really closely with the VA um, on developing innovative ways that families can receive those services and support without even leaving the home, which allows folks like you guys to get care easier without having to travel you know, hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles yeah. to do that. Wow, that's amazing. Um, you mentioned that, that your study had identified a gap, and that gap was that the organizations didn't understand that were across the, the U.S. there were all of these caregivers. Are there things that the Elizabeth Dole Foundation is doing to cause those caregivers to have opportunities to learn from each other? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for that question. There's essentially nine areas where there are significant gaps in support as a result of the study. And folks have probably heard, you know, many of these mental health support, care and support at home, which I just mentioned, employment, workplace mm -hmm. support, which Eric's organization really is leading the way on, um, and, and many others. And so what we've done, and I, I'd say the most important effort we've undertaken of late, is um, something called the Hidden Heroes Communities Program. Okay. And we're working with mayors and community leaders in 120 communities across the country. We were just in Minneapolis last week um, launching their initiative to work with those local leaders and to make assessments on the ground in communities like Minneapolis mm -hmm. and San Diego, and these are communities large and small in every corner of the country, to see what kinds of services and support exists for okay. caregivers, um, how we might integrate caregivers into, for instance, programs that might be exclusively for veterans, okay. and then work with the community to teach those organizations and stakeholders how to support the veteran, but also how to support the family. Um, I think one of the most important things that I've learned uh, as an organizational leader in the veteran space based in D.C. is that there's a big divide between what happens here inside the Beltway and what happens out across America where people desperately need help and support. So this program allows us to translate all the progress we're making here in D.C. from a policy and impact perspective directly on the ground in communities with organizations who are making an impact on that family so that families like theirs um, can benefit in real time. And so we're teaching communities essentially how to step back and assess and care for the needs not just of the veterans but of their caregivers and families as well. I love that holistic approach. Thank yeah. you. Tom, there yes, are 3.8 million veterans in the, U in the U.S. with a service-connected disability. How does Home for Our Troops select which veterans will receive new adapted home and which veterans are eligible to apply? That's an excellent question and we get it all the time. Okay. Uh, and we don't have any doctors on staff. Uh, okay. So, you know, as a nonprofit, again, located just outside of Boston, uh, that's not something we can really get into the medical evaluation. So we really depend on the government to help us out. So we start one of our initial criterion um, for eligibility for our program is actually veteran must be eligible for the Veterans Administration Specially Adapted Housing Grant. Uh, and it's a program that is uh, congressionally appropriated uh, as well as uh, the 
eligibility requirements are established by the Congress. So we're depending on them uh, to actually evaluate the veterans and determine the ones that have the most severe uh, injuries. And these really fall in, into the areas of uh, loss or loss of use of multiple limbs, um, full partial paralysis, um, and, and other things along, sure. along those lines um, that uh, they would then be eligible for the SAH grant. Then once uh, they become eligible for that, then they can apply to our program. A lot of the veterans that come to us uh, aren't aware of the SAH grant, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a daunting task to apply okay. and become eligible for it. So we actually have a couple of wonderful ladies on staff that know the system extremely well, okay. have a wonderful working relationship with the VA and the SAH program, uh, and they will walk them through the process to where they can become eligible for it. And then once uh, the veteran's eligible, then they can come to us and get into our application process. Um, we have an application. We also do a couple other vetting procedures. We do a criminal background check, okay. and we also do a financial health check over the last several years. And um, because of the, uh, the financial planning assistance that I mentioned earlier that's provided free of charge, we decide whether we start that early because some of these guys, uh, not so much Stephen here, but some of these guys are extremely young, been okay. injured early on in their life. And I don't know about the former Sergeant Major of the Army, but when I was a young pup in the Army, uh, I, I did not uh, have it all together on uh, my financial side. So some of these younger guys come to us and they've gone down range. Uh, they've been paid a lot of money. It hasn't been taxed. And they come back and do a lot of different things with it, buy a lot of toys and different things and they're kind of upside down financial. So we take a look at the financial health of the veteran and see whether or not we need to start this financial planning assistance early or we can start it later when they get their home. Um, so we go through that and then the last thing we do is we actually bring them up for conference uh, in Massachusetts. I won't say it's the home of a certain football team because <laughs> all my guys from the staff will get excited about that. Um, but we have a veteran conference, normally two to four of those every year where we bring in the new members to our family uh, and then uh, start working on finding their land and building them a home. I, I would say about the SAH program um, that just last week, uh, we had a tremendous opportunity to partner with a couple of VSOs and the VA as well and testify before, uh, wasn't the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, but one of their subcommittees on economic opportunity on ways to improve the SAH program and what we brought forward as our recommendations were actually accepted by the subcommittee and the VA as things to work and try and get better. And we're really after uh, blind veterans being included into the SAH grant program and veterans who have lost their hands. Because wow. there's, there's the definitions that they have for it. And, and the, the members were actually asking the VA rep, is that something that you can do and make those changes? or do you need statutory authority? And uh, of course the rep said, no, we gotta have congressional authority. And they said, well, we're gonna get it for you. So it was a great opportunity, but again, partnering both with the VA and a couple other VSOs. I, agree. I think it's great that you're using what you're learning uh, from helping veterans to make it even better, make it a stronger program. That's great. Um, your organization has just published some interesting findings about how your homes empower veterans in their recovery. Can you tell us about the impact that your adapted homes have had on the lives of veterans and their families? Absolutely, and for everybody that's in the room, if you look to the seats uh, to either side, you've got a little pamphlet that looks like this, and, and everybody watching, we can certainly get them to you in, in the members' offices. Uh, just let us know. But I'd, I'd just like to hit a couple things on the impact. Our, our tagline is building homes, rebuilding lives. So building homes is really the one thing that we do, but rebuilding lives is what's really important to us. The building homes part of those numbers that I was throwing out, but those are just uh, outputs. What we're really after measuring are the outcomes. What's really happening uh, to these veterans and their families when they go into these homes? What are they accomplishing afterwards? So this uh, document here, when you take a look at it, covers a bunch of those areas we did a we've always had from our applications we've had the going in information where they sit in, in various areas like employment and education and finances and things like that but we didn't have the after they've been in the homes for a while so this past winter 
Uh, we devised a survey, went back out to our veterans and the families. Uh, we actually had a 64% response rate, which That's gives huge. us data we know is solid. Uh, and we looked in the areas of, you know, asking about their freedom and independence and rehabbing in a safe environment. We asked them about, again, uh, education, employment, family, finances, all those kinds of things. And, and just to give you a couple of them, over 90% of our veterans responded that they have now regained the freedom and independence in these homes that they had lost with their injuries. So that was really good for us. On the education side, uh, before moving into our homes, um, our veterans either had a degree, were pursuing a degree or a trade certification, only 12% of them. Mm -hmm. After moving into our homes, that shot up to 69%. On the spouse and caregiver side, we really thought we were having an impact. We, we honestly knew in our gut that we were having an impact on the spouses and caregivers because most of them will tell you the story that if they have injured veterans wherever they're living, that they sometimes don't even want to leave the house uh, because they're worried about their veteran falling. They got mm -hmm. really small young children falling, hurting themselves, the child. So again, it's that stress and burden on the caregivers. Well, on the education side with the caregivers, only 8% of them had a degree, were pursuing one before moving into our homes. Afterwards, 90%. Wow. And then on the employment side is the only, one, only other one I'll point out for you. Um, and it, it gets back to what Eric was talking about. On the employment side, before uh, moving into our homes and then going into them, our veterans ended up um, with an employment rate of 67% higher after moving into the homes. And on the spouse and caregiver side, it was three times higher than before they moved into our homes. So that's some of the impacts, but thanks for asking. That's huge. It well, is. now we're to where the rubber meets the road. Steve, <laughs> Sam, pressure's on you. Can you, <laughs> can you tell us about how the home that you receive from Home for Our Troops helps you in your day-to-day -day life? Uh, definitely. So I'll kind of give you a little bit of my background before Homes for Our Troops. Um, like I said, I was injured in 2006, lost my left leg below the knee. Um, my physical therapy went pretty well. Uh, I was, my leg was amputated December 1st in January. Sometime I started, uh, no, in March the next year I started snowboarding. Um, and then that kind of became a new thing for me and, you know, I got to where I could run again. Um, I was, everything was pretty normal. So when we left the hospital, we moved into a two-story townhouse. Uh, never really had any issues with that. And after a few years, we decided to buy a house. So we bought a two-story house with a basement. And um, that first summer we were in the house, I started having issues with my residual limb. Um, mm. Just a lot of leg pain. I would get sores. I was wearing my leg for probably 16 hours a day. Okay. Um, so pretty much turned into every summer. I'd spend about two months in my wheelchair in the middle of the summer just letting my leg recuperate. Um, mm. And it pretty much took me out of the action altogether with the family. I mean, I could use my wheelchair outside of the house because our, our house just wasn't conducive to uh, using a wheelchair. So my wheelchair stayed in the garage or in my vehicle and uh, I could get around work and you know the stores pretty well but at home I'd use crutches and um, can't really do a whole lot with, with crutches. Your hands are pretty occupied so I wasn't helping out with the kids. I wasn't helping out with laundry or cooking or cleaning. I pretty much just sat on the couch um, kind of angry with myself for two months every year. Um, and at some point, we started looking for other options. We found, actually, Sam found Homes for Our Troops, uh, told me to apply a couple times before I finally went through with it. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's honestly, it's, I couldn't imagine how much better you know, it could be. I mean, you think about um, getting a free house, that's, that's pretty awesome in and of itself. Um, but going from a two-story house to a, a one-story house uh, changed. It changed things a lot for me. Just not having to go up and down those stairs multiple times every day, I think, has taken a lot of uh, physical stress off my leg. Um, I don't have the issues I used to have so often. Anytime I do feel something popping up, I can just hop in my wheelchair and get around the house, which mm -hmm. alleviates, you know, a small issue turning into a large issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's made me also become a, a more active participant in our family, so I don't get away with not doing laundry. I don't get away with 
not doing dishes or helping out with the kids. I mean, there's, there's really nowhere in the house I can't get to, even if I'm <laughs> in my wheelchair, including outside the house. So, you know, even if I'm stuck in my wheelchair, I'm still taking out the trash. Um, <laughs> so, you know, for me, mentally, it's helped out a lot because I don't have to get um, stuck in a situation where I can't participate. Okay. Uh, it helps me and Sam out, you know, because if I'm, if I'm grumpy, she's grumpy, and we're, you know, it's kind of just, there's a lot of friction there. Um, I'm, I'm sure our kids saw that. So that alleviated that. And then, you know, I won't speak for Sam, but I'm sure it alleviated a lot of stress on her part as well. Okay. Sam, what are your thoughts? How has it helped? Um, it's been honestly pretty amazing. I think one of, there's two stories I always think about when we lived in the three-story house with the basement. One, I remember coming home one day and he was hopping down the stairs with our infant in his arms and should not have been doing that. He eventually scooted on his bottom, but still wasn't safe. Um, and living at the other house, he would always, in the middle of the night, would just hop and go straight to the, like, to go to the restroom if he needed to go. Um, and he, at the new house, that doesn't happen. I mean, there's no stairs. Um, I hear him in the middle of the night putting his leg on and like actually walking. And um, We don't have little kids anymore, so that's, he doesn't have to carry them, even though they still like to be carried sometimes. But it definitely has relieved a lot of stress. Um, I feel like we communicate better okay. because we're not so stressed about anything in regards to doing things around the house. I feel like he lives a more free life. Like He loves um, going outside and working in the yard. We have chickens and a garden, and he loves doing that. So I feel like there's freedom for him to do that now, too. Um, He'll even go jump on the trampoline with the girls and do backflips, which I think if we still live at the old house in the summertime, that wouldn't happen because those probably five to seven summers that it did happen were very stressful. He wouldn't play with the girls just because he couldn't. Um, it's not like he didn't want to. He just he couldn't do it. Um, and you could tell like it was devastating for them. And they loved how active he is now, even though we're definitely not on the younger side anymore. <laughs> it's so fun to watch your interaction. That's so cool. Yeah. Steve mentioned about caregivers, and you're a caregiver. Could you expound upon what that's been like and um, how you've reached out to other caregivers or they've reached out to you, and if that's made a difference, and if so, how? Definitely. I will say he's made my job pretty easy in the caregiver aspect right after the injury. Um, he was always lighthearted about the situation, which I think helped while we were at the hospital. Um, once leaving the hospital, you know, things definitely changed because I wasn't around, you know, other wives or spouses who were, already, who were at the hospital that I could talk to on a regular basis. Um, so the first couple years was definitely rough. I didn't really speak to um, many wives my age who were going through the same thing. Um, and then probably about seven years ago, um, I met a lady who was kind of a part of an organization, um, Hearts of Valor, for caregivers. Um, and we connected um, with a group that was in our local area. So we would have like group meetings once a month, which was fantastic. Um, it was nice to really talk to others about the situation um, because they understood, they knew kind of what I was feeling and they understood that even though I loved my husband, there were things that other people just wouldn't understand. Um, so that was really nice. So, and I've been connected with her for the last seven years. Um, we were, we, we've been lucky enough, too, to find friends who were previous military. And while their spouse isn't injured, I, they, they have that military connection. So I can definitely talk to them about some things. Um, because I think it's always good to talk to people who who kind of understand your background, um, but it's also nice to have friends who still want to learn and understand the stresses that we do have um, on a daily basis, because it's not just the leg. I mean, we have memory issues, so we have you know a family calendar that was an idea given to us that we've been able to use to help with that. So it's nice to have people to really just talk to and on that basis. Awesome, great news. Jason. Um, as an advisor to the Veterans Affairs Secretary, you have no doubt observed both the successes and limitations of what VA can provide. 
Are there some ways outside organizations can partner with VA to improve the care of, for veterans? Yeah, absolutely. Th such a good question. And what a humbling answer to listen to your story. And then um, what I'll say uh, particularly to that is, uh, Steve, you mentioned uh, the great work the Elizabeth Dole Foundation has done. And uh, the secretary last week announced uh, our Center for Excellence, which is based on uh, family and veteran caregivers. And this uh, center of excellence is going to allow the VA to study across its network uh, and academic facilities what we're doing well, uh, where we need to strengthen, uh, where we've learned lessons from other organizations. And so the focus of the secretary is now, how do we do this best? And it's all because organizations like Elizabeth Dole Foundation have been applying energies in that direction for a long time. So I'm really glad to see, number one, that that's um, something that we've announced as, as recently as last week, I think September 7th. So um, other ways, everybody else here on the board has kind of weighed in. I think the, uh, the hiring of troops, the building of homes, I'm the veteran service organization liaison. It's a, it's a huge role, it's a huge um, community. And what we look for, the VA is uh, the second largest department in the government, uh, something like 340 or 50,000 employees. Uh, we service about 9 million veterans. As you can see with our facilities, we have a gap. I call it kind of that last mile. I'm a veteran myself, and when I came home, I didn't have any means where I didn't know anybody. There was really not the same need for me to approach the VA. So um, one of the first things I think people can do is uh, what you've done here, Sam, which is uh, you've got to turn to the people you know, you're, you're the ones that you trust and care, and be able to kind of uh, kick them in the gut a little. I think most of us in the Army or uh, service members that have gone through some of those experiences were probably the last ones to raise our hand and say, I, I need a little help. Am I, am I right? <laughs> so for, for those people who know a veteran who's had some of these experiences, it starts with the community. And this is where the VA really relies on those service organizations to know our, um, our community members, our service members, and know what they're missing so that someone can actually put them in touch with the right type of organization that can actually facilitate their benefits. I think somebody else mentioned how daunting the task can be uh, because there are you know, three different administrations from health to benefits uh, to National Cemetery, and they each handle a number of different uh, things that a veteran might go through in their life. So we have a, essentially a large conglomerate of services that are very difficult to navigate if you haven't had the experience with it. And so we rely on organizations that have a particular cause or an interest, such as Elizabeth Dole Foundation with caregivers. And when they have that interest, that passion, if you can find them and link up with them, they're typically uh, subject matter experts. They're hand in hand with us, uh, creating legislation and policy, uh, staffing working groups to ensure that the policies actually are met and then executed in the field. There are so many things happening in the department at any one time that it's overwhelming uh, to start fresh and not know where to go. So you really need someone that can help you navigate or Sherpa you through our institution. And that's where the veteran service organizations couldn't be any better. We have a tremendous amount of them out there. They're very, um, there's a very large population of military service organizations and veteran service organizations. We maintain a website uh, that lists those that we've recognized, and then there are plenty that are uh, not yet recognized but still doing good work on a local level. And so if you can find those first, you're going to find folks that are really passionate about a, a cause. And once you find those folks, it's a lot easier for them to help you access the services and systems you need. Now, in our defense, we're trying to make that easier. But in the second largest government uh, agency, that is not an easy thing. Um, this year, we've been very happy uh, with the work that Congress and um, the previous president and this president have engaged in to pass some major legislation. And I think Secretary Wilkie uh, has famously said that we've had more change now on the books by statute and law than the Veterans Administration has seen since really its inception um, or really under the Omar Bradley in World War II. So we're experiencing some very new things and the future is, um, I think, uh, very bright for us. We have to be cautiously optimistic because when we do well, uh, we get a story like you've told 
uh, but that's a combination, a joint partnership here. And when we don't uh, find those gaps, um, then we have the opposite story and, and we need to mitigate those to the extent possible. So very much relying on our partnerships. Well, you've mentioned briefly that there's some pending legislation, yep. also that there are some, some new VA services. Um, would this be a good opportunity for you to kind of do a quick commercial for, for either Absolutely. of those for this audience? Yeah, I'll try to make it as boring as possible. Now, uh, <laughs> very exciting, the, uh, the VA Mission Act that just got passed is one of the most expansive uh, acts. It's appropriated $5.2 um, billion. Part of that, too, is an expanding on, on caregivers. So we, we recently, or legacy caregivers, were only post 9-11. So we've now rolled that back to those who've been giving care to veterans from the Vietnam era and the Gulf War era. And it's a recognition on the VA's part that we did have a gap in the, in the environment. Uh, I think you mentioned, Steve, that the study that Rand did uh, told us about what's happening with our veterans, our younger population, how we're bringing them home, and then how we can actually care for them in their homes rather than facility. So part of the VA Mission Act will help close the loop on that. Okay. In addition, um, there's so many other good parts to it, but uh, electronic health care modernization, this is an effort for the VA to do what I think is a common sense uh, modern technology thing, right, by allowing the service member to step into the you know, once you swear in, you have a service record, and that record will be electronic and will carry with you for the life of you, including when you leave uh, your service and enter the arms of the Department of the VA. And right now, that's, that's a legacy system we're dealing with that has uh, great features to it, but it was built 20 and 30 years ago, so we're now at the phase where we're about to initiate a change in that, which will hopefully facilitate uh, a lot more uh, care with a lot more... Um, speed, if you will, now. The veteran who has his record carries it with them and then can share that out, whether it's internal to our community or as importantly now, especially with the VA Mission mm -hmm. Act, external to our community care partners. Mm -hmm. And that's another component of the, of the Mission Act, which is we've found that uh, where the VA does well is when you get in the door, <coughs> it's when you can't get in that we have to service our veterans. So allowing veterans to choose their care in the community has been a vital piece, and that's going to happen with this as well. Plenty of other stuff, but uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I would ask each um, panelist if they <coughs> care to share a one-minute uh, commercial, if you will, of what you want folks to have gotten from this panel. Um, so, Eric? Thank you, uh, and I'll keep it at one minute. Um, you know, I think we've talked about this a couple of times, and it's certainly something my organization has really started to realize and has been realizing over the last couple of years as we talk about military spouses and caregivers. Um, you know, from our organization's perspective, and as we continue to serve those who serve, uh, we look at service a, a little more expansively than, than just the person who puts on the uniform. I think if there's a uh, a gap between the civilian military divide. I think there's a chasm between uh, what our country knows about military spouses and caregivers and the service and the sacrifice that they made. Uh, as we get into September 11th tomorrow and closer to Veterans Day, you know, I'd ask those in this room and, and those on the, on the webinar to really think about military spouses and caregivers from the vantage point that they serve to. They've served and sacrificed for our country, and as we think about how we can meet their needs, uh, we need to think about the entire family that serves around that service member. Thank you, Eric. Steve? Um, I'll just say ditto. Eric put it really well. Um, I guess I'd remind everybody in the room and those watching that you know, less than one half of 1% of our country um, is defending our freedom in the armed services, which means there's 99% of us <coughs> who don't really understand what happens inside mm -hmm. of military families and the challenges that have been discussed up here and that are happening every day. And so I'd like to remind everybody that um, our job really um, is only just beginning. Uh, the, the veterans who are continuing to come home from this longest period of war in US history um, are bringing complex needs and issues to the home front and they mm -hmm. have a family and community around them that need to be embraced and supported. Um, and it's up to all of us 
to ask what we can do. Mm -hmm. um, so inside of our employers and our churches, um, our community organizations and our neighborhoods, seek out your military family neighbors. Um, they're, Sam and Stephen would probably say that they're reluctant to ask for help, um, but if you find them uh, and you offer, usually they'll take you up on it. And sometimes it's the simple things. We, we know, for instance, most of our families just need a break. Um, mm -hmm. Babysitter, cut the lawn, help them get the groceries, those sorts of things. But it's really up to each of us to, to seek mm -hmm. out those neighbors, friends, uh, family members, and see what we can do to help them. That's awesome. And that, that really falls in line with what we believe at the Veterans History Project, which is listen, really listen to the veteran in your life and let them know you are listening. Tom. Thanks, Karen. Um, for everybody here and tuning in, uh, the first thing I do is challenge every single person uh, to just reach out and touch five people and help with awareness nice. on what you uh, heard about today. The organizations you heard about, go ahead and check us all out. Uh, and then uh, specifically uh, for us, we've got 1,000 to 1,200 more of veterans uh, like Stephen and, and caregivers like Sam that still are in need and really deserve these kind of homes. So we got a lot of work to do. Um, the second thing I'd say for the staffers and members uh, that may have tuned in or will tune in and, and watch this over in the coming days <coughs> is we discussed uh, some of those um, things with the uh, SEH um, program, the grant program that needs some change in. Uh, to bring some work out. We're leaving some veterans behind in that program right now. So I would ask them to go back and, and support the efforts of the Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity as they move forward with that uh, with the VA. And then last, um, I would also say uh, for both my cohorts here in other charities that, that both mentioned about uh, you know volunteering, uh, helping out, and you don't have to wear a uniform to be serving all charities out there, all of us need volunteers. Uh, we won't succeed without our volunteers. So get online, uh, check us out, and get out there and help these veterans. Thanks. Well said. Steve. Uh, I'll hit on a little bit of what Tom said. Um, the road to recovery for uh, service members like myself really uh, is really built on a combination of uh, organizations like the VA and all of the different veteran service organizations. So you know, if you know of a program that the VA offers or a veteran, organ veteran service organization out there that could help out a veteran uh, that you know or in your family, um, it really, it's a really good idea to give them a push, you know, give them a kick in the rear to go and reach out to those organizations, because like I said before, I would not have applied to Homes for Our Troops, or I wouldn't have applied for the SAH grant uh, if Sam hadn't have kind of uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, guided me in that direction uh, multiple, you know, over a, a long period of time. Um, and, you know, really, I would have been, I would have been missing out. Um, and I've, I've talked to veterans who have that mindset where, you know, I'll, I'll let the, the guys that need it most uh, access that care. Um, and while that's an that's a admirable thing to, to think and feel, um, you really should leave it up to the organizations to, to decide who needs that care the most. Um, and on top of that, uh, like Tom said, you know, look at those veteran service organizations, uh, do your research and know, you know who the good ones are, you know, and donate, you know, your time and your money, your resources to help these organizations out so they can help out, you know, guys like myself. Great. Thanks, Steve. Sam, thank you for all that you've done and your support of Steve. It's great to hear that you're behind making a difference. Definitely. Thank you. And your thoughts? Um, I would definitely just say to any caregiver out there, um, find somebody who can be there to support you if you need it. Um, or maybe if you know a caregiver, um, and maybe you're not one, but you know one, always just ask them how they're doing. Do they need something? They'll probably be like me and say no, 
but I think that they'll understand that somebody is still there and someone still cares and is asking how they're doing for sure. If somebody asks you what you needed and your tendency is to say no, what's the one thing they could do that would brighten your day? Um, I think really for me is, I think just them asking, even though I say no, um, okay. just that they will ask, initiate and ask a question. Um, or even if it's just asking, how, how are you doing? Or how's the family? Okay. Um, I think just asking for me is much more than anything than not asking. Uh, I think that even goes with saying with like an injured veteran, um, you know, don't just stare at them. Most of them will be willing to talk about it. Even if it's just like, I'm okay, but just ask. Definitely just always ask. That's really good advice. Thank you. Jason. Yeah, thank you. These have been incredible comments, and so uh, I, you know, I have to uh, commend the panel. Uh, I, I think it's been said, and I'll emphasize that you know we don't serve as single um, members; we serve as families and really as communities, uh, because when we put service members in war or in conflict, we do that as a community. So knowing that, when the service members leave and come back to reintegrate in society they can only be reintegrated also by community, family, and uh, peers. And it's been said a, a bunch of times, but if you're out there listening, I'll, again, I'll just say, um, like Steve, myself, and the peers that I served with, uh, those in harm's way, they're mission-focused and they're mission-oriented, and they're typically the last ones to say, you know, pay attention to me or give me the care. So we do rely on our spouses and, and those who are our peers to kick us in the gut a little bit and get us moving. So if you know folks like that, just know there's, there's an initial resistance. But at the other end in the community are these tremendous organizations, businesses, um, charities, VSOs, MSOs that are ready to support. And right behind that is your government. We, we, we brought you into service. We're going to continue to care for you. Sometimes it's a little difficult figuring out the path or navigating that path, but that's what we're all up here for. You're, you're not there alone. So if anybody hears this message out there and feels that way, it's time for them to kind of tap out and say, hey, I need a hand. And you've got plenty of people ready to help you. And at the end of that, um, the organizations, the Veterans Affairs Department are all here to support our veterans. So um, make sure if you do know someone, ask the question, and then follow up and get them into the hands of that next level of care. Wow, that was so really well said. I think what um, the folks that are here today and also those that are listening um, have heard about today is about re re rebuilding lives and also that it really is an arc of a story. And I think we've heard that there's lots of people involved with that, everything from the government to nonprofit organizations uh, to the folks that are living the life. And, and I want to thank all of you for coming today and being a part of this. Um, right before we end, I'd like to bring up uh, Patty Calitano and also um, Tom, if you would. Um, they have been kind enough. They are going to make a donation of some veteran stories to the um, library's Veterans History Project. So, um, first off, we got we got to thank Karen and uh, Veteran History Project and the Library of Congress for putting this on today, um, and also. Thank you for your own personal dedication and service to our country over time and for what uh, you and your outfit are doing every day to keep veterans and families in the forefront of America. We really appreciate it. So what we've got for you uh, today are uh, four recordings from our HPOT veterans uh, as entries, uh, permanent entries into the Veteran History Project. And we really do hope that in some way they uh, help further the cause and the mission of you know, educating the American public on both their services and their sacrifice um, on behalf of those freedoms that, you know, we enjoy every day. Well, Tom, on behalf oh. of a grateful nation. Thank you. I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and I would, I would also like be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the staff of the Veterans History Project, specifically Andrew Huber for making a difference, and the staff from across the library um, that made this all possible. So thank you all so very much. And again, panelists, thank you for coming today.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.